Hi everyone, it's so great to be here with all of you today. I've seen so many of you in the State House recently, but I definitely prefer seeing you not there, anywhere but there. <laughs> um, I'm really grateful to be in this space. It feels, I've been here just for a few minutes, but it feels really calm and grounding, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to chat with you for a little bit. Um, before I go too far, I just want to say that, you know, all of my organizing and how I think about the world is really centered around values and not party. And, you know, we have an incredible Republican state senator here with us, and I respect him so much. And um, none of what I'm about to say is really about party. It's about values. And, uh, you know, my values, oh gosh, does anyone want to join my hotspot? It's called Ugushaka. Whatever, I can't get rid of it. You're just going to have to look at it the whole time. <laughs> um, you know, my beef is with the Democrats and how the Democratic Party has not reflected the values that I care about around climate justice and racial justice and all forms of social justice. And so that's really why I'm about to go on this tirade here. Um, oh, you can waltz. Okay. <laughs> so I grew up in Nobleboro, a small town of about 1,600 folks on my family's farm. And I just, I've always loved Maine. I love, I love this state so much. And one of the things that I love is that I grew up not really caring about party. It wasn't until I got access to the voter database in 2018 that I looked up everyone who had raised me. They were all registered Republicans. And sometimes I was genuinely shocked because you know, we just focused on, are you a good person? Are you a good neighbor? Do you show up when someone's in need? And that's how I was raised. It really wasn't until I went to Harvard for college where I was exposed to this like really vehement political divisiveness that was really shocking to me. And I, I didn't like it. And I actually ended up making friends with my co-author, Canyon Woodward, who is also my campaign manager for both my campaigns. He also grew up in a very rural place. And so it was kind of that ethic that drew us together. And you know, something about organizing at Harvard and living in a liberal city, I resonated with the values, but I realized I could never bring that work back home to Nobleboro. I knew it wouldn't land, and you know, we just needed to find a different way to do things. I think in 2016, in the aftermath of Trump's election, myself, like probably so many of us, were like, wow, what just happened here? And one of the things that I took away from that election is that the Democrats completely abandoned rural organizing and rural campaigning. And it was in large part because of that that Trump was elected and we faced a really bad four years. So um, I finally realized that I grew up in a state house district and a state senate district that voted for Trump. You know, I felt like it was kind of at the center of this conversation of how rural areas are really swinging to the right. I also began to realize in 2018 how you know, not only have Democrats abandoned rural organizing, but we've really abandoned local organizing. Throughout Obama's presidency, the Democrats lost over a thousand state legislative seats. Our focus has been almost exclusively on suburban and urban organizing. And so what we're doing is paying attention to statewide races, like the governorship or US Senate, instead of being able to really dig into local organizing and understand what's happening in, happening in our communities and being able to elect good folks at the local level and at the state level and even US representatives. So all of this was kind of swirling around my head. Um, there was one more fact that really stuck with me. You know, back in 2009, if you asked a rural voter, are you voting Republican or Democrat? Uh, there was no partisan preference. It was basically 50-50 even split. But today, rural America leans 16% Republican. So there's been a wild, huge swing in the past decades in, amongst rural voters. And so the question is, um, you know, what are the consequences of that? And to me, the consequences are that we don't have the political power that we need at state levels and certainly at the national level to be able to achieve, for example, the kind of climate justice policy that we all care about here. So all of this kind of led to uh, me deciding to run for office. I had worked on a bunch of different campaigns and 
I kind of felt like campaigning could be a good ground zero for rebuilding trust in rural America because you, it's like this rare opportunity where you can drive down someone's driveway, knock on their door, sit at their kitchen table, and have an honest conversation about what's going on in the world. Um, the campaigns that I worked on were really extractive. You know, as a volunteer myself, I would go to someone's door. They had clearly had five other people knock on their door that week. It felt completely and totally pointless. I was always in a city. Then I would go back to the campaign headquarters by myself, have the world's worst cookie, and then move on with my day. And I was like, why, why have I just driven three hours and spent five hours canvassing? Um, it really felt completely useless. And as a staffer on campaigns, I just saw the intense focus on numbers and data. How many doors have you knocked? How many phone calls have you made? You know, when you send volunteers out, they have a clipboard and you're supposed to identify in one minute if someone's supporting a candidate or not. It's like, I don't know how anyone would respond to something like that. I certainly wouldn't. So when we decided to run for state representative back in 2018, the goal was to do it all entirely differently, to see if there was a different way as a young progressive in a very conservative district to, um, you know, build something, build something that was meaningful and that lasted. So um, I'm kind of starting in the middle of a slideshow here, um, so apologize that there's no nice screen. I also really stink at graphic design, so this is like my best effort here. So District 88, it was just redistricted, but it was the towns of Whitefield, Jefferson, Chelsea, and half of poor Nobleboro. Um, similar to the national trends, it had a 16 per 16% point Republican advantage, um, which is another way of saying negative 16 percentage point Democratic performance index. It had never been won by a Democrat. And uh, most of the district lies in Lincoln County, which I know there's some Lincoln County residents here. Such an interesting county. 100% rural population tied with Piscataquis. It's the oldest county in the entire state. And uh, Maine is the oldest state in the country and the most rural state in the country. So a lot of like symbolic dynamics happening in Lincoln County. Um, okay, so we start campaigning and we're like, okay, we're not gonna take any resources from the Democratic Party. And the reason is, now I'm just gonna read something off my phone that I just wrote the other day, because I wrote this paragraph and I was like, oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> um, so this is just a little bit of a list of how the Democrats at the highest levels and it's trickled down to the state level, unfortunately, have created this uh, mindset that we don't focus on rural folks. Um, okay, after the 2010 midterms, when the Democrats lost 63 House seats, Nancy Pelosi disbanded the House Democratic Rural Working Group. Harry Reid then eliminated the Senate Rural Outreach Group. In 2016, according to Politico's Helena Bottom miller evich the Clinton campaign intentionally decided not to spend resources on rural voters only assigning a single staff member to rural outreach in their Brooklyn office late in the campaign. Chuck Schumer proclaimed that Democrats would pick up two votes in the Philadelphia suburbs for every blue collar vote they lost in Western Pennsylvania. And in 2018, the chairman of the DNC, Tom Perez, told MSNBC, quote, you can't door knock in rural America. And so when we started campaigning, we were told straight up by the state party, don't go and talk to Republicans. Uh, so we were like, no thank you. <laughs> um, I already gave you my disclaimers. So we started um, to just organize, you know, to go and talk with folks. We had these uh, really amazing canvas days. This is from our 2018 state rep campaign. Um, I have Canyon circled in here. Um, it makes sense if you see the whole slideshow, but I, I spared you some of my boring story. Um, you know, so like these pictures mean a lot to me because they're people from high school, you know, people from my life, all of these young folks who like came out and canvassed to um, all of these Republican and independent voters. These are just some of our pretty photos of canvassing and our house parties pre-COVID. Um, we also did all of our own volunteer trainings to try and get away from some of that, what I was talking about before of having like a really disempowering volunteer experience. So all of our volunteers were trained in 
deep canvassing is what we call it now. Back then, I never heard of that term. But you know, we just talked with folks about how do you have a conversation with someone based on values if they have a Trump sign on their lawn? How do you, how do you go and do that? What does that look like? How do you find that common ground? And then people would come back to our campaign headquarters and we'd have music and tons of food and play capture the flag. And um, it was just a really fun experience. OK, so these photos are also really interesting. What we found in 2018 was that um, since we didn't use the Democrats' resources, we created our own canvassing universe, which is the, gr like the targeted group of people that you go and talk to, because you don't knock on every single door. Once we started knocking on Republican and independent doors, we found this incredibly disturbing trend, which is as best embodied um, to the screenshots on the far left, these are mini, this is the minivan app. I don't know how many of you have used it. It's what you use for canvassing. It gives you like the person's address and name and you know, gender, so you have like a general sense of who you're looking for. So under survey question history, on the, bottom, on, the on the two to the left, you can see it says none. That means that these voters have never in their entire voting history been contacted by a Democratic candidate or campaign, ever. You can see in the, like, the right middle one, um, that person hasn't been contacted since 2008, like maybe the last time the Democrats had some infrastructure in rural America for Obama's campaign. And then the one on the far right is an example of where the state party came in and took their state party uh, script to a door, and the person was going to vote for the Republican. But then we went to the door, and they voted for us. So all four of these people voted for our campaign even though they had never been contacted by a Democrat before or in a very, very long time. So it was kind of eye-opening to see up front how we have left behind these stories. How can we have a party that reflects rural voters' voices and needs and hopes and dreams if we're not even talking to them? Another key part of our campaigns has been um, doing a ton of door knocking. Um, this is, so again, this is from a state house race, but for when I had a primary, I did eight passes through my universe, and for my general election, I did four passes through the universe. So people see that you're actually making an effort to get in contact with them, and if I did talk with someone, I talked with them at least two times. So you form like somewhat of a relationship. So we won in 2018, which was very exciting. I'm gonna skip through this stuff. And then in 2020, I decided to run for state senate. Um, for a bunch of reasons, you know, my passion is around movement organizing, building these movements. State house districts in Maine are really small, you know, like 9,000 people, and our Senate districts are around 40,000 folks, which is also more comparable to what we see in other states in terms of the size of districts. So we really wanted to scale up what we had done in 2018 and see if it could work in something that was slightly, slightly larger, um, and also just build the movement a little bit more. And so off we went. Um, we ran against Dana Dow, who at the time was a Republican minority leader. He had never lost a general election. And in retrospect, the Bangor Daily News gave us a 42 to 1 odds of winning, which was, uh, I wish, I'm so glad I didn't know that at the beginning. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, it was a big fight. But we just started to do exactly what we had done before. And again, we didn't take any resources from the state party. We launched um, with a beautiful potluck pre-COVID, but then COVID hit, and oh my gosh, it was so bad um, because our entire campaign had centered around being able to knock on a ton of doors because I don't know if you know who Dana Dow is, but literally every human being in Lincoln County knows who Dana Dow is. So we had like a lot of work to do, but COVID hit and it was really inappropriate to campaign. So we pivoted our entire campaign infrastructure to calling seniors regardless of political persuasion. And uh, we ended up making over 13,000 phone calls with 200 volunteers and getting people, you know, prescription pickups, rides, no one had a ride to their doctor's appointment or their chemo, you know, food, whatever people needed, we got it for them. And it was just an amazing example to me of how campaigns can not be so extractive and can give back to our communities and be really, um, really oriented to what people need. Um, it was actually interesting because once we started doing this, the state Senate folks started doing it, but they told their members to only contact people in their persuasion universe 
which is really, really, really bad. You only deserve help if you're going to vote for a Democrat. Um, so then, you know, we just kept doing what we do. Something that we had done in both of our campaigns is tons of letters to the editor and tons of hand-painted road signs. I think we had more hand-painted road signs than we did actual, like, glossy, yucky ones. Um, you know, and we had like these really beautiful outdoor gatherings together, just kind of building our movement and getting people involved with the campaign. We also, like we did this in both of our campaigns, but we designed all of our own content. We didn't use any of the party's consultants. Um, so this means that we saved one third of our entire budget because if we had used the party consultants, all of that money would have gone to a consultancy firm from DC. The other thing that we did in our state senate race, by creating our own universe, um, the party gave us a universe that was really only focused on talking to Democrats yet again. And we created our own universe that was f four times bigger than what the party advised us to use. So a combination of having a bigger universe, talking to more people, hearing more stories, designing our own stuff that doesn't look like it's just come out of um, a uh, you know, campaign cookie cutter machine, it like really resonated with people. And so many people would reach out and be like, oh my gosh, I got your mailer and it actually stuck with me. We also ran a completely 100% positive campaign, never uttering a single negative word or publishing one. These are just some more, oh, thank you. These are just some more fun photos. Um, and this is one of my favorite slides that kind of sums up what we did in 2020. So we had over 200 volunteers that were separate from our COVID volunteers. We did 5,000 handwritten postcards um, where we had folks write them to their own neighbors and we created like a little list for them. We had over 100 letters to the editor. Instead of having our canvassers actually canvas because of COVID, we had them do lit drops. So we had over 6,000 lit drops. I ended up knocking on 13,314 doors. I don't recommend that to anybody. Don't ever do it, but it's what the times required. Um, and we did a ton of phone banking. So in total, our direct voter contact was over 86,000. So all of this is just to show, oh, the second highest in Maine was 34,000 um, contacts for a state Senate race. So all of this is to show um, what we can do when we take a slightly different approach. Um, you know, the folks at the, state, at the state level in Maine and in all states are doing really good work. They're just doing the best that they can with really limited resources. Those resources are just not working for rural areas. And so my community is left behind. And I know that our voices aren't heard in places like the state house. So Canyon and I wrote this book called Dirt Road Revival, How to Rebuild Rural Politics and Why Our Future Depends on It. It's coming out May 10th. And it tells the story of our campaigns, makes the case for why Democrats need to invest in rural America. But more importantly, there's three chapters in here of all of the lessons learned from like the really high level strategic planning to the on the ground nitty gritty. Um, and we wanted to write it because we were just so shocked at how left behind people were, but also so hopeful that there is space to have these conversations. So. Um, we want to invite you to our book events. We're doing one May 9th in Portland at Space Gallery, and then we're doing one May 10th in Damascata um, in Hometown District 13 with all of our community to celebrate it. You can go to dirtroadrevival.com and all of the event info is on there. I apologize for the shameless plug, but that's just what we got to do these days when you, when you publish a book. Um, but we're really excited about it. It's been endorsed by Naomi Klein and Robert Reich and Bill McKibben and so many folks that, that we uh, really love and admire. So that's really all I got to say. And I'm so grateful again for you having me here today and to see all your faces.